very impressive and, and done it without uh, a lot of the noise and uh, turmoil that you see in some of the old, old other school systems. So we are absolutely delighted, even though he's a graduate of Ohio State, to welcome Joe Rugano here. <laughs> speak from out here if it's okay in doing it. I just want to acknowledge we have two board members with us, John Heckman and Julie Glavin are here and tonight's our awards assembly over at the high school where all scholarships are being uh, divvied out. So it's a big night for the high school and a big night for a lot of seniors. I know this afternoon at the chamber luncheon I remarked about scholarships and how important and it used to be back in my day you were fortunate to get a scholarship and it would help out. Today it's almost essential you get some help uh, to go on to higher learning, whatever that higher learning may be. And one of the things we do stress with our, our students, although we are clearly college-bound oriented, we have many students who do not go on to college that find successful and rewarding careers either through the vocational uh, program, and many of our students go to the vocational program and then go on to four-year college. Um, so our, our goal is to try to find out what would complete their career and start their life plan the way it needs to happen. Uh, I just can't uh, not take the time to meet with this group and not thank you once again for the help. The last biennium in 2011, we ran into some problems with a change in the funding structure that would literally cripple our community. And I firmly believe this, and I've said this in other groups, if it wasn't for the cooperation of a lot of individuals in this room, along with the club as a whole, that thing would have happened. And fortunately, uh, I think we all did a good enough job to stop it that it has not returned in this year's budget request. And uh, I don't know if the governor's new formula is going to get back in there, but the formula uh, spared the tangible tax issue. And that was a huge, huge uh, part of the backbone, financial backbone of this district. So uh, thank you for that. I'll always be in, I will come back even after I retire and talk in front of you or something. <laughs> but that, that's how important, I'll never forget the crowd in that auditorium and the personal phone calls. Denny, we had some and, and some other members in the room that took their time. Um, John, we had conversations during that time too. I just thank you very, very much. I don't ever want to forget to say thank you. Uh, because, and I hope we've done well with what we've kept. I just want to give you a quick update about the schools, some of the key issues that are around. And I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm going to be talking to some folks tonight and not asking for money. <laughs> she thought that was unusual because usually our circuit is uh, around levy time. But in this case, it isn't. And if, if you were one of the group back in that auditorium, we talked about a three-legged stool, which was uh, arts, athletics, and academics. And the whole point of it was that if you remove any of those three legs, if you change anything in the formula, not funding formula, but the formula that makes this district what it is, once you saw that leg off or you shorten it, it will never be equal again. And so we work very hard to make sure the arts are treated with the same respect and budget-wise that athletics and academics are. That's been a that's been a uh, hallmark for a long period of time. I see Mark out of the corner of my eye. If you have a student or know somebody who was in one of our AP courses, his dad was a um, tireless supporter of, of taking those AP courses and not making them only for science and math and language arts, but across our curriculum where we have opportunities for students in art and music to get AP level instruction and take those tests, which transfer many, many times into dollars. And, and his dad was very much responsible in making sure that uh, those kids were not forgotten, and they haven't been. And it's been the basis for our arts program uh, at the high school. I think you've seen from some of the assessments that have gone on, uh, we tend to keep our rank. We try to improve every year uh, about what's happening. Our student body changes, the community changes, but what stays is the same appetite for success. The thing that has always made this job easier for me is I never had to talk you guys into wanting the best. You wanted the best, and you wanted it in a way that's economical and fair and equal to the uh, broadest number of students. And that's really the foundation of our school district, to be able to put all that together in the way I just described. And the community has found a way to support that over the years. And by, I think you know that means financially. And now it's also volunteers that help us 
from time to time on committees where we've opened up projects to our strategic plan committee to make sure that everyone feels the ownership. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, our Science Olympia team, you probably saw the paper this morning, again won the, uh, a national title. The national comparisons uh, show up often in things like Science Olympia, which is very important, but it shouldn't be lost on the total overall success of the school program. And let me give you a little bit of snippet, a snippet of what I'm talking about. The top 20%, 25% of the schools in America compete at the highest level worldwide. So some of the information that you receive that our students are not competing is true when compared to the total. When you compare it to the group that we're talking about, our kids and our students, in districts like ours, and quite frankly, Chagrin Valley, Orange, and Chagrin, compete at the highest level, higher than really other parts of the world. And so those are the students with that kind of talent that we're blessed with, uh, that we have to have the program to provide that. We just recently had two students I think I have this correct. There was, there were, in the world, there were 2.2 million students who took 3.3 million AP tests in the world, and we had numbers, I think, 16 and 17 in, in um, computer science and uh, economics. 16 and 17 out of those 3.3 million students in the world. Uh, not by not by happenstance, the, the one computer teacher was somebody that we actually hired from Hiram, a college professor, brought into our staff many years ago to make sure that uh, the emergence of uh, computer education and computer literacy for our highest level students, I'm not talking about guys like me, I'm talking about those that can come in and reprogram as 16 year olds, they needed to have a foundation that was strong in and those are the kind of teachers for that in economics that we had to have in those courses. They are high level instructors. We lost one to Sean Yee. I don't know if you had Sean at the high school and your parents, but Sean went to San Francisco to a university from it. So we've been very blessed to be able to attract and retain. And the number one reason for attraction, I know you think it's salary, and it's a big part of it, is not that, it's the student group you get to work with. That for a teacher that understands the importance of providing an education for children uh, doesn't want to try to convince the superintendent, for example, that we need to do this. We know what we need to do, we just have to find the right folks to do it. And so we're very blessed. And it's part of this uh, synergy that I talk about all the time, and that is to keep, to keep the rolling success continuing in the community. So that when changes are made, when uh, people are replaced, and new people come on board for whatever position, that the synergy of the, the district takes them. There's no rebel that comes in and wants to change the way that things are going because the schools are defined around the community needs and goals and expectations. And that's really what we what we follow as part of it. So we're, we're very excited about the student uh, achievements of this year. We should rank once again. There are some things happening in the state you may have read where I've talked about um, how they're ranking school districts and what is happening. It's really a, a different system and um, it's probably not the most beneficial and I'm not sure that we're going to be able to change it. But let me give you a little snippet. Teacher evaluations and school district evaluations will be built on growth so that if a student grows more than one year in any subject area, it's the more than one year that would get the highest rating. Um, the problem is that we have, and every district like ours, Orange and Chagrin will have the same problem, Beachwood will have it, and that is this. When you get students in the sixth grade that are achieving at outcomes at the eighth and ninth grade, there's no room to prop them. You just, you can't prop them to that level. So the best example I can give is the one you read in the paper this morning where the Science Olympia team was last year's, last year's uh, national champion. This year they were national champion. Last year their grade would be an A, this year it would be a B. Yeah, no growth. No growth. Right. <laughs> so they're gonna work their way through it. I think we'll take some lumps in the, um, uh, in the ratings as they have them. I will tell you this though, the performance of our students in all of those tests will continue to drive uh, what we do in the district and they will perform higher and better on each year. So just, um, as you see these things come through, you'll see some of the um, 
some of the issues that are happening at the state level uh, as part of it. So we kind of move from what's happening on the local level to what's happening on the state and national levels. And the, uh, the governor's biennium budget, I thought was a, a pretty fair budget for all schools in Ohio. Uh, for, unfortunately, when you cross Route 18 in Medina, you're in a, you're not only in a different county, you're in a different state. And I think the uh, downstate influences are, Bob, you probably know better, the tremendous downstate influences that happen that uh, are different than, quite frankly, northern Ohio. It's, called, it's just different. It's called the Caveman Caucus. Is it? <laughs> yeah, I, I understand it. So the needs of those places sometimes, just on the basis of uh, votes that have to happen, are going to come that way. But, but the budget uh, was uh, fair to us. It, was, it didn't increase us. It didn't take money away. It allows us to continue to operate at the level we're operating on. Financially, the district's in, I think, great shape. Uh, nothing on the horizon in terms of levies until 16, 17, perhaps even on out. So that would have given us probably about seven years between levy and, uh, so we're going well on that front. We're going well on the academic front. We have teachers leaving, which are difficult to replace. We will have, uh, in the past two and a half years, we'll amount to about 75 teachers that we have replaced that uh, through our program to, to move them on out and bring other fresh young teachers' talent into the school district. So we've been working on for literally a year to find the right people to bring into the school district and they'll assimilate into it. Our enrollment is dropping a little bit. It was exactly what we predicted for those that were on strategic plan committees. Whenever a community tops out, whenever it reaches its zenith, it always falls back about five, seven percent. Um, you fold in what's happened in the economy and the, and the house, uh, housing market, we've lost about that, about five percent of our enrollment. But you know what? That's not a bad thing. Less kids to educate helps money to go further. So, unless you're selling your home, and then that's a problem. <laughs> but, uh, you have to work your way through that. So those are those are things. Certainly on the financial end, we're where we should be. Uh, on the performance end, I, I believe where we are is where we should be. We're going to be changing some of our exam structure. Um, there's an OGT test that the students now take. Next year will be the last test for that. So if you're a, a high school, you take a Ohio graduation test. That's leaving. Students will have end of course exams all four years of their high school. And um, honestly, I, I, I support that. I think that's a good change. I think it, it provides more rigor in the course area, more depth in understanding what each course is about. So I, it was nothing that I, that was a state initiative, but I think it's, it, it works. And for our kids, we'll do better. One final thing. There's one thing I always read, the one statistic that I always pay the most attention to. And when you see the state results come out, they'll come out in August or September. And it's always the performance index. And that's the one where we perform at the top. The performance index is really not the measure of the top students. It's the measure of the top students, but the way it's structured, it's really the students that don't have the same skills as the top students. Me, those of you that are like me that were in school, forcing their production forward, forcing their um, um, competencies forward, and that's what we lead the state on. And, and that's because of this, our simple, our simple rule is that every kid, every day, they deserve that. They really deserve that. And um, that's what we're going to give them. Whether they want to take it or not, we're going to push it, and we'll see where it goes. But to move every level, wherever the student is, to move them to the next level. And if they're not, we want to know why from teachers. So we can put together a plan. The final thing for our success, if you take away one thing, our, <coughs> excuse me, our changes are done in real time. We do not use the, we're very close to the medical model. We do a lot of assessing and a lot of prescriptive changes and then, and then get better outcomes. Um, the, the dynamic that uh, you used in uh, most school districts is you assess at the end of the year, look what the problem is, make a change for the next year, and then you wait another year to assess it. We don't do that. We assess by the week. Every week, every child gets an assessment in the basic discipline uh, the five basic disciplines that they're being taught. That assessment is then adjusted. Um, I'm not saying every week because there's not a problem every week. But when there's a common problem and it begins to show up either in a particular teacher 
on an often times or uh, across all third grades, those changes are made within a week or two. So we find out what the issue is. Because that child that's in the third grade is having trouble reading, can't wait to the fourth grade to get caught up. They won't get caught up. Same thing with the fifth and sixth grade. So we gotta have them on track at the end of every school year. If you are not on track, you may be asked to go to a summer program. And if you're a parent and you don't go, we'll ask you to sign off on it. We've made these arrangements for you. But it's making the change in real time and not allowing it to become a condition. It's like not treating a cold and all of a sudden you got pneumonia. You know, treat the cold, find out what the problem is. It could be the teacher not doing something correctly or misinterpreting something. And then we change it and we move forward. And it's worked very well for us. So, and, and of course you all know that in business, any money you spend on retooling or recidivism is just, it really is wasted money. So uh, we would prefer, really prefer to move forward than try to work with, create less folks that need that, that help. So with that, that's kind of the capsule of what's happening in the school district now. Um, um, I, I don't know that any outstanding issue, it really is one of the more calmer well, I say this now, watch tomorrow morning. But <laughs> it really is, there's, there are no budget issues out there. There are no uh, glaring academic issues. There are always academic issues and there's always budget issues where you make decisions, but there are none out there that are glaring. Um, we continue to compete well with other school districts, other states, and other countries. And that's where we have the student body to do that. So we're going to, we're going to do that and we're going to do it in the most economic way that we can do it. Part of it. So, with that, if you have some questions, yeah, Danny. Joe, share with the crowd, as you were sharing with me right before we got started here, as to the transition. Okay. All right. Sure. Not just for you. Right. But the transition prior to you. Right. Danny was talking about uh, how long I was going to be around, and uh, I just turned 65, so it's not real long. <laughs> but, uh, but. Uh, I think um, in our discussions with the board, when, when this happens in a year or two, probably two, that really the, the, the administrative structure will remain in place. Uh, there are key people in, in every district. And, and I could start rattling off, but I can't, probably can't escape saying Debbie Siegel's name here <coughs> is one of the key components of the district who's just a magnificent um, curriculum person. And, and others are going to kind of be locked up. And so the new person coming in will be the really the only one. I think what, uh, in talking to board members throughout the time, and I'm going to paraphrase for them because I, 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 I think it's this. And that is, I don't think the district, I don't think the board or community wants to bring in a new leader who's going to bring in this buddy from here or that person from there and change the dynamic that is here. We have to have someone that will follow, that understands the dynamic and is strong enough to follow for a year to, you know, to get it on, to get an understanding of, and make sure it's the right place for that person, and then move it forward. Um, I know they get questioned all the time about, you know, it's a succession plan, this or that. You really can't have one in Ohio because the, their boards are chosen every several years, and you can't choose for another board. You can't say in 2018 or whatever it is, this person is going to be a superintendent because it could be a whole different board and they have their decision to make. So statutorily, there's some things that are consecutive, but hopefully that uh, the only change that will happen will, will be at the top and those folks that have been judged long-term successful employees in the district, I think are gonna be given the opportunity to stay and uh, assist the new person getting acclimated in it. The, the thing that person's gonna have to catch on to is the fiber of this community and I understand that, that that's, that's where the success will come from. If that is misread, then, then you'll see there will be conflict. And I think uh, they made a great choice with our treasurer, Tim Picana, and uh, Tim's on vacation this week or would have been here. Uh, he's an outstanding treasurer. He's the right one for this school district. And I have no fear that uh, they'll make the right choice in the next superintendent. Yeah, John. You know, we all lived through what went on in Storm. So can you talk a little bit about your relationship with the teachers and the board's relationship with the teachers? I know. After being around for a long yeah. time, what it is, but I think people have to hear. Well, our relationship has been, I think, excellent with them and them with us. Um, being able to find the, the type, first of all, we have a non-affiliated union, and that means that they are not affiliated with the OEA or NEA. 
and they're not affiliated with the AFL-CIO. They are their own local bargaining unit. Yeah. So it does, but it does make a difference, and uh, it follows. Mm -hmm. uh, I think may, uh, actually this just happened in Southeast at Lindhurst also. Shaker is the same way. You see some of the top performing districts have gone this way, uh, and some of the success that it brings is being able to reason with employees about common interests that are good. The kind of teacher I talked about that we hired from Hiram, uh, we were able to convince him, and, and this is kind of, the, and this is part of that soul and agreement that I talked about, and I feel this every day, and, and the issue is this, you keep the schools there, we'll, we'll take care of it. You know, as long as you spend wisely, it's, it, you're gonna be supported. That teacher needs to know the same thing when they're hired, that you know, they'll move through the salary schedule the way they do it. So being non-affiliated is, is a good thing for us, uh, we spend a lot of time talking with them about student needs, and there's our student need in uh, language arts, for example, might cost them 30 minutes more a day to work, and we work it out. For, and it's not for cost, but we work it out. And if we can show, I, and I'm pretty confident saying this, if we can show a definite benefit to the student and, and for the district, it's going to happen. It may take a while but it's gonna happen. But there's some great folks, it's great to help. There's a lot of folks that live in the community, which is a great help be part of it. They're part of the fabric, and uh, uh, the relationship has been good. And uh, you know, and it followed, there's a story, where I never really didn't know if it's true, but supposedly there was a strike back here in the early 60s. And as a result of that, in the collective bargaining agreement, we are not allowed to bring in outside negotiators. So it's board members and superintendent, three people, two board members and the superintendent, and three people from them, and we sit down and bargain it out. I mean, we're all under the same law, we all follow the same proposals, we do the collective bargaining thing, but uh, we go a lot on trust, and trust is what makes, makes, the, uh, makes the difference. They're good people, you know, you have to remember sometimes, I always tell them this, you know, it's a school and it's also a workplace. You're not going to, these guys aren't going to school, they're going to work as, as teachers. So um, they have their needs, we take care of that, and the community has done that. And the one thing they get that they don't get in every community, and I will tell you this and thank you, it's respect. Uh, if they've earned it, you've given it to them, and we appreciate it. It is essential in today's environment to for them to earn it and for you to acknowledge it. So it, it has been a good run with it there. Leadership goes back. Uh, many years, many issues, but um, they've, they've been good. Of course. Yeah. Um, what do you think are the, the top three main differences between a nationally ranked school system like Solon and a school in some educational backwater like, say, Tennessee or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> you think that question? Somebody must be <laughs> 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 that question? Backwater? He he's, t he's taking a jab at me. <laughs> Fairly. <laughs> I, I tell you, I don't know about three, but I know the one. The community has to want it. If it has to want it and demand it. And if you don't, I think problems. I think the problems in the inner city, cities, you know, not only just Cleveland, but all the inner cities. I mean, if you look at, take just take a look at Ohio. Look at the seven major inner inner city sector, large district. Uh, you know, it, you got to think about it. They're they're not all, the people on the board are not all the dumbest people in the world and they're not the worst teachers in the world because we hire Cleveland teachers there's some excellent teachers that come out of that systemically there's some other issue you have to want to have an education you have to be uh, you have to desire it you have to give up for it you have to honor it you have to treasure it and our parents do I mean I will go through graduation night here in, next week right We'll go through that, and we'll talk to parents that night. I mean, the most genuine and thoughtful thanks and understanding of what, what the value is that they've achieved with their kids. We would have never done it if they hadn't followed through with their kids. One of our best secrets was, and your dad, we always talked about this, was the money we don't have to spend on discipline. We don't have to spend to have six assistant principals at the high school, four at the middle school, or whatever. Parents tend to take care. Now we still suspend, we still expel, don't get me wrong. But in the most part, parents take care of business. They're accountable for their children. And, uh, you know, we made a change through the Strategic Plan Committee and the board approved this uh, about four or five years ago 
where every student into the district is assessed on where they are academically, and if they're a fifth grader, and they're not performing at a fifth grade level, they don't come in at fifth grade. We put them where they can perform at that level, start them there. And secondly, they're indoctrinated into what the soul and way is and expectations. They sign off and their parents sign off so that when issues or problems arise, um, we, we have that affirmation that they understood it and that they knew what they were moving to. You know, there's a syndrome out there that's like, you know, bring them to Solon and, you know, they come in as a junior with two credits saying, well, you're in Solon now, so don't you have a program for that? So we don't really have a program for that. You got, you got 19 credits to go <laughs> and that's the program. So, you know, those are those kind of, um, we have a high demand level in terms of what we ex expect and the expectations. But trust me, if you take if you take rigor and high expectations out of the equation, it just won't it won't happen. You know, so we demand a lot. I know I talk to parents about homework a lot, and there's a lot of philosophies and theories out there about the importance of it. I understand that, but I know our kids are working uh, a lot into the night and, and progressing themselves further. So that's a judgment parents have to make. But we do have a lot of homework in our district and a lot of uh, I think uh, growth because of it. One of the, uh, this is a club question now, and I'm not going to phrase it very well, but one of the things that we talk about here is how can we interest some of the students at Solon High School, for instance, in what we're doing, and vice versa, uh, you know, how can we find out more about what would be meaningful to them? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I would work with one of our government teachers. I think that would, yeah, just, I mean, Young Republican Club? Yeah, they have yeah. Okay. Right. They are, the we would like to exist. Oh, I, I think they would welcome it. All right. Terrific. That'd be great for us, too. Sure. Yeah, thank you for uh, speaking to us tonight and also for the wonderful job you've done. Oh, I have two kids, K through 12, that are doing well from being under your tutelage. Um, I am personally very concerned with Common Core curriculum uh, starting 2014, right around the corner here. Yeah. I know a lot about it, I've studied it, and I, it sickens me, truly sickens me. What, you know, you can have people rave about it all they want, but no, there's no evidence that this thing is good for our students. Uh, in fact, I think there's more evidence that it is not good for our students. And I can cite over and over here what I do know about it. And people are turning <coughs> against it every time they get to know about it. So um, I, I, there's one good thing that I can find in that teaching to the test and uh, the fact that it took 16 uh, days to be uh, adopted in our state uh, from proposal to adoption under Strickland um, coming on just so fast that there's no the train that's going to come hit our Cool. Well, it is fast. It will. It will. Um, it will push down yes. uh, curriculum that was essentially middle and high school. Uh, I think 40 states, I think, have adopted it so far. It's a large number. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, for any of the issues that you think you might have an issue with, I think the process will take care of it because I don't see. Um, I, I think the one thing that has to be guarded against, and by the way, this is a state of Ohio and 40 other state initiatives. It's not something that was from the bottom up, but from the, the top down. I think the one thing you have to guard, it, some of these issues, when you look at child, child development, some of them are, are gonna be a problem. I, I think we all can see that. So that when you're looking at a sixth grader with algebra one, for example, let me just follow me for a second. Sixth grader for Algebra One, uh, you simply are not going to have all sixth graders be able to, to do that level of curriculum. And then what's going to happen is you're going to start dividing the student body into this group or that group. Uh, whereas um, intellectually and emotionally, they just haven't reached that level. The kids need time to grow. I, I think it will work out in the long run. Uh, you probably know on the end more than I know. All I know is that. Um, a lot of it, though, and I will say this, mirrors our district in a lot of ways in terms of 
um, providing access to the curriculum for parents that want to push their kids into it. So that if you want to take an AP course and you don't meet our model, you can still sign your way into it and be part of it. But um, it's it's twofold. Number one, it's to provide more rigor lower, and the second is an attempt by our government, and I believe this, what I'm going to say, to pull along that 60% I was talking to you about. Because they believe that without that push, without that requirement that you do this, that bottom 60% isn't going to change. So we're going to teach the, the bottom 60%? Well, I don't, think, no, I don't think we're going to teach the bottom 60%. I think the, I think the rigor for our kids will be, I think they're going to see it quicker. I think we're going to see the opposite, to be honest with you. You start doing, you start doing upper level math in the sixth, sixth grades and preparatory work in the fifth grade. I can tell you, not all kids are even close to being there, and I think that that will be the problem. Well, it'll move calculus right off the, uh, get out of it. The whole thing. I mean, when they move algebra up, then calculus is inaccessible to our students. Why would it be inaccessible? Uh, well. I have a lot of things here that, that are just sort of under the curtain of this huge, huge situation, but um, curriculum. Um, so something here about uh, well, maybe I'd be happy to talk to you about it, or you know, once you get outside the confines, but. I, I think we need to have, I think we really need to have a meeting on common core curriculum is what I think. Well, when we, when we know it, I agree with you, we're kind of targeting September, October, but until the state makes some of these decisions, well, we're just right now holding back because people are finding out what is in this curriculum okay. and they want to slow that process down. Well, I maybe it will, and I would be okay with slowing the process. <laughs> but yeah. I, I can tell you it's on track for, as you said, for 14. Yeah. Um, what is it? Oh, there's so much stuff in it that um, where this came from was really professors uh, and policymakers right. in Washington. It wasn't the educators. And well, I'm an yeah. educator. Well, here's the, here's the problem with the educator part. Let me just say that I always say to our teachers, you know, how do we get all these rules? Third grade guarantee. How do we get this and how do we get that? And so we got them because they didn't think we were doing the job. That's how we got it. And uh, honestly, that's the that's the toll for poor behavior and performance. If you want to be master, I mean, this I, I truly this is my thought. If you want to be master of your, you better be the best at what you can do, and then you pretty much can stand up and say whatever you want to say. For I just don't think the public for the last 20 years. Remember, nation at risk. That whole discussion is for the last 20, 25 years have been real happy with the performance of the public schools and then you look at it further and it's more defined in the lower 60 percent of and unfortunately it's tagged in income but if you're in those communities the value is less in those communities so my whole thing when i talk to our group is you don't like third grade guarantee make it real simple every kid passes it then you're not bound by it any longer you know it's a reasonable expectation it's a pain believe me and it's a costly one for some districts we're lined up for it and our costs will be minimal but for us to be able to stand up and talk about something like uh, calculus or something else, you better you better damn well be the best at what you can do in those. Otherwise, there's no discussion. What what discussion could there be? We need to be the best at algebra and whatever, and then we can perhaps get a seat at the table. Yep. On another topic, kindergarten registration this year is flat or down? Down. 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 How does that dovetail with closing the elementary school? Well, if it continues, I mean, we'll, we'll know in August for sure. We'll have met our two-year mark, and we'll begin those discussions again. Uh, Bob's talking about the, with the strategic plan initiative. Uh, we're looking at closing an elementary building in the community um, uh, to make sure that uh, we as just efficient as we can be in our costs. So that will happen probably sometime in the next several years. Which one? Uh, we don't know yet. Who has? Did you? Oh, we don't know yet. No. I don't want to in the school. Well, um, our, our habit has been when we've either closed, we haven't closed one here. I've opened them here. And we do that. We've, we've worked so kids can finish. And, you know, if it's kindergarten to come in, they'll start in the new attendance area. If it's a third grader, we'll, 
will phase in and phase out. Are you with, with the real estate market picking up slightly? Yeah, I know. Are you seeing any spike at any grade level now? No. Nothing. There's no yeah, people yes. coming in with older kids. No, but it doesn't get crazy, Bob. Like right now, it starts. So um, I think we set that date like an off, make sure to make sure that we accounted for all those things. And I know we take. I mean, I think just from. I mean, I think I've talked to more medical mark uh, future or current. I don't know if they're operating down there. People, I don't know if you know any of the community, but they this has become a prime spot. Eaton too. Yeah, Eaton too. Right, a large part of it. So, you know, I, I don't think we'll be above the curve. I just think that we're part of that also that natural decline that I talked about. When you get to the top, it's still a, it's just a great place to. Joe, Nancy, the, the quality is low. It's not internationally benchmarked uh, in math. They would uh, put many children two years behind uh, achieving uh, high achieving countries. Okay. Algebra went in ninth grade instead of eighth grade, which makes calculus inaccessible. Well, I don't, I don't know where that's going. Algebra is not going to be in the ninth grade. Algebra is going to at the end of the 14, 15, at the end of the 14, 15 school year. Six graders will be getting in algebra one, so I'm not not real sure where that's that's coming from. Where, I agree with you. If you push it up, yeah. well, you force everything. And we can, a district like ours can't do that. We have to we have to have the expansive curriculum at the upper end to attract the students that we need to keep this district where it is. So I agree with you yeah, on that point. Core is adopted in 40 states as. K through 12, right. if we're going to do what they tell us to do, what the curriculum, unless you opt out. So that's the way it's going to be. I can tell you more horrible stuff, but um, okay, but I'm not familiar with teaching to the text, only teaching the text. Well, that's part. The, the test taking is part of the accountability end of the whole thing. So I, I mean, that comes from the public. And it the doesn't come from. And evaluated by the test. Yeah, I know it's a difficult, it's not, nearly impossible. It, there's no, uh, there's no flexibility for a child. It's, it's a flawed idea. Um, every child across America will be on the same page at the same time. That's what this whole is all about. Right. It was founded by the Gates Foundation. Everything about it is Gates Foundation. I do know that. And uh, yeah. it, it, the governor. But they are also <coughs> under the tutelage of the Gates Foundation. A lot so of money. Everything is a lot of money in the Gates Foundation. Yeah, I have a comment then, a question. Um, first of all, I'm glad to see you a little bit better mood than two years ago. <laughs> the, the meeting, you know. Thank you. We were really worried about you then. I do remember, I still remember then how you were in one of from. Um, State representative yes. area and it was serious. Uh, my comment was actually I want to thank you and uh, the SOLM teachers, I guess, just day before yesterday, Sunday, uh, how old his daughter graduated college, so, and the uh, University of Rochester, and thanks God found a job already, so, and by thanks God I mean we I don't know. need to pay anymore. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, this is kind of just. Um, <laughs> goes to her and at the same time uh, in my opinion credit goes to that uh, how she performed because of the teachers and everything and so on. So this is part of the things but my question is you're probably aware of um, Los Angeles uh, school districts like a new rule or something you may have heard that is uh, uh, students can no longer be suspended if they did something wrong. No, it's a I mean, is this type of ridiculous... It's not going to happen. No, no, I, I know <laughs> we're not there yet, we're close, but my question is, because you were talking about discipline, behavioral things, right. I mean, are we going to this direction? How will we uh, compare? Because it's easy to say, oh, well, come on, that's Los Angeles. But, uh, I mean, is it a trend which is comes slowly but surely toward us, you know? I, I don't think so. I think the values of the left coast and the you know, Ohio are different. Well, let me just, let me share with you a couple of things about suspensions and expulsions. Um, when I meet with parents, uh, there's a hearing that happens. An expulsion, so that you know, is a school administrator can remove a student for up to 10 days. Anything after 10 days, even one day, is an expulsion. 
So when you read that, say, someone was expelled, you, you think they're gone to some other you know, island somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it could literally be one day. Uh, ours don't run one day, but it, it could be. That's number one. When I talk to parents and there seems to be this disconnect about they need to be in school, I always ask them three questions. I say, what did your daughter or son have for dinner last night? What was their homework? And tell me the grades on their last report card. I've never had one yet in my 20-some years that can tell me all three. And it is a, it is a universal, uh, those kids are generally there because of their parents. But how much money and public money can you spend to change that behavior? At some point, an expulsion or a suspension is either a timeout if it's a suspension or it's a, we're done. We're done. How many times can you steal? How many times can you cut school? Don't tell me you're going to cut school and you want to be here. It's an incongruous argument. It doesn't make sense. Uh, we do a lot of it, honestly. Um, when I think my first 10 years I had two expulsions. <coughs> We're up around 25 this year. No, no, I give you. I am for more strict uh, so, discipline. But, and you have to, you, to yeah, no, no, I understand. I'm not trying to be the tough guy. I just want you to know that disruptive kid affects your son or daughter. Right. That's the part that people don't get. People think, well, I'm being, you know, I'm expelling Denny, and, you know, you don't care. I do care about it. I care about the others more that want to be there. You have to do it. You have to remove them. Sometimes they recover. We've had several cases where the kids recover, come back, and actually do pretty well. In other cases, no. They go on to this, they, they go on to some other cycle. I can't be responsible if someone doesn't want to be responsible. They, they can't take care of their responsibility. I don't ever see that happening. If, you, if, uh, if school officials lose control of the schools, they'll lose control of the population. They're not going to support that. I just don't see that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you made the comment about trying to find good teachers and yeah. replacing good ones. And people, a lot of people have asked me, oh, you live in Solon. How does anybody get to be a teacher in Solon? <laughs> is there some criteria? Is it you have a long waiting list? Is it, <laughs> you know, or or isn't it as hard as people think it is? Uh, it's, it's, but I think it's hard in every district. I'll bet every district has four or 500 applications backing up whatever positions are open. We literally have a thousand for the elementary positions. So I, if I were to tell you that we're able to vet all those, you know, I don't think that's true. Uh, but we start interviewing very early, and they all get the same. We do the protocol where everyone gets the same set of questions, and then from personnel it goes on to the uh, to the building principles, where they're really vetted in terms of instructional knowledge and do their philosophies. For example, do they believe a student should be expelled or suspended? And in what circumstances would they re I mean, those are things we screen for. We screen, whose responsibility is in the third grade guarantee? Well, if a teacher says, you know, it's the first grade teacher and the second grade teacher, they're, not, they're probably not going to be here. You have those kids for a finite period of time, and you, you they are being judged in, on how they accept that responsibility. So, it, you know, is it difficult? It is. It is. But I think it is for... A lot of jobs in a lot of the private sector, too. I mean, it's just a difficult time. Yeah, Joe, I would like to, uh, from the bottom of my heart, like to say thank you to you from the very beginning and to all the administrators and all the educators throughout the years. We moved here. We chose to move here for a reason, and we were not denied what we were looking for. Sure. So as, as a father, as a proud father of three that went through stolen schools, yeah. They have excelled. They did. You did everything your system said you were going to do, and I would like to say thank you. Uh, well adjusted. For all of them, I'll accept yes. that. As pre yes, thank you. <laughs> you know, I have to tell you, the, the, the times I smile the most are the parents that come back uh, after their fresh kids' freshman year and they came back and said, snap. That's a goal. Um, kind of to piggyback on, uh, on on her question, from a teacher application perspective, mm -hmm. um, we also have children in the school, which sure. I guess is no surprise. Um, we've had the pleasure of dealing with some very good student teachers who I know are in the applicant pool for open positions in Solon. Is there a way that we can help out? Oh, you yeah. know, what, what can I do? You can email me or okay. the personnel. Uh, email to me and I'll make sure. Okay. 
we see through every one of those student teachers though is guaranteed the opportunity oh, right. I mean they've had the best interview right <laughs> they've right. been there for mm -hmm. right uh, and quite frankly every now and then we have a sub that, that comes through and, and I mean those are difficult jobs to do but for those that want to really um, bury themselves in the curriculum and understand the philosophy of it those so, are so those folks are kind of at the head of the line, those folks who have the opportunity. Well, they're not the head, teach. they're in line. Okay. That's okay. a big distinction. Okay. Um, I, I don't know that there's any, uh, there's any head of the line. Right. Um, but they're in line, and that's, in this environment, it's pretty good. Okay. Yeah. And, of course, we screen for, we just don't take every student teacher out. So, right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Okay. Listen, I thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. I, I would just like to leave with one thought, you know, when dealing with the, uh, the issues that we see in Washington. A lot of what you see in an organization is the ethos that comes from the top. And, and I really want to say that Joe has set the kind of ethos for the soul and school system that makes them what they are. We know he didn't do it alone and he would admit that. But that being said, he has developed an atmosphere of trust, not only with the teachers' unions, but with the parents and uh, with the students that go to that school. And I think that is a, a remarkable thing. We have been blessed to have him here for the years that he's been here, and he's going to be damned hard to replace. Yeah. So, Amen. Joe, Amen. Thank you very much.